Welcome back to another episode of the Great Compromise podcast. This week we're doing something just a little bit different. Um, We're doing a switch up episode. So what that means is that both Jim and I have picked a topic that is typically um, a Republican or Democratic like issue that we disagree with. So I'm going to be talking about how I'm not anti-gun as a liberal person, and Jim will be talking about how he is pro-LGBTQ issues as a Republican, and we'll just get into that. So let's start. So like Victoria just said, I am pro-LGBTQ rights. I support individual liberty and the right for all Americans to have equality. Love is love, and you should of course be able to marry whoever you want. Honestly, Republicans being anti-LGBTQ is going away with the older generation, in my opinion. From my experience, it's far less of a right versus left issue and much more of a generational one. Everyone I know who's around my age, Republican or not, supports gay marriage, and I think that's great and how it should be going forward. I think you're right. It is more generational than um, Republican versus Democrat, anything like that. So when you are thinking of LGBTQ rights, does it matter in your opinion whether or not being gay is a sin? What do you believe? It doesn't matter, frankly. Um, I'm not terribly religious, but I don't think it's a sin to begin with. And so, no, it doesn't matter whether it is or not. People are people and that's... People are different. It's okay. Right. I mean, it's such a common argument that it's a sin and we shouldn't allow, you know, whatever stems from that to take place, like marriage. And I I agree with you. Like, it's more about are we allowing every person the same rights as the other? If I'm allowed to get married, anybody should be allowed to get married. I don't personally think it's a sin, but I think it's a bigger problem to be finicky about who gets to do what with their lives. I hate that. Especially when we're talking about like a political and legal standpoint. You know, the word sin shouldn't even come into our vernacular. It, it, sh- it shouldn't be related at all. Whether it is or it isn't doesn't affect what the government says is possible. And so, well, it shouldn't. It, it should But it's yeah. definitely in the conversation very it, often. It comes up, but it shouldn't come up, frankly. Yeah. Do you think that one's ability to understand or not understand transgender people matters? Or should it be more, you know, you can be confused by it, but that doesn't really factor into the issue at all? Well, define matters because, unfortunately, it it does matter, right? Like, people, people always fear what they don't understand, to quote the first Batman movie. And it's true. They do fear what they don't understand. There's all this... Um, talk about grooming these days being associated with um, particularly um, trans folks. And so obviously that is not true. These are people who don't feel comfortable in their own bodies with their own. They feel their identity doesn't match their physicality, right? And like whether or not people understand that doesn't matter because that is the reality, whether or not some stranger understands it or not. At least it shouldn't matter in theory, but the people who don't understand it are running the government, right? Exactly. And so that's when it becomes a problem. You can fear what you don't understand. Yeah, that's the human condition. But when it comes to preventing other people's basic rights, then we have a problem. Yeah. And I think that it's more about um, allowing people to feel like accepted that are already struggling And creating those rights, it's just like it's a generational thing. It's definitely a very historic thing to say that being gay is a mental illness, right? Like Mm -hmm. that used to be... That was common. That was really common. And so I think that it's more of like a sign of the times that like everybody experiences things very differently. And that doesn't mean that one is entitled to a privilege that someone else isn't just because of the way they're experiencing the world. Exactly. And that's how I look at this issue. Um, how have you tried to become more aware of LGBTQ issues? Uh, Personally? Personally. Uh, you know this, Victoria, but the listeners might not. I mean, I grew up in a small rural town in in New Hampshire, and so our demographic is 
straight white people, and that is all we've got, basically, as far as the eye can see. We've got more straight white people than trees here, so that's basically what we're working with. So I wasn't exposed to this stuff growing up. It wasn't really on my radar at all. And, like, even when I got to high school, I went to a larger high school that, like, encompassed a few different towns. I started to get exposed to that, but not enough, right? And so, like, it's only now, a little college, but it's really only now where, like, I've, or years after college, I've had to think to myself, like, what is actually right and what is actually wrong? And so these are things that I have taken my own time to do the research on, like I do with any other issue. I do my research and, you know, I, it's exposed me to new ideas and that is always a good thing. And I don't think I was ever anti-gay marriage, but I certainly have better reasonings to support it now. I think that's a really important part of growing up and developing politically is that you're educating yourself and questioning the beliefs you were raised with or the beliefs that like seemed really commonplace when we were a kid. Like in the 90s, that's very different from where we are today as far as like equality and issues and rights and stuff. So like there yeah. is, I think it's important that everybody makes understanding and educating themselves a really like important priority. I tend to do it because I'm interested in what I don't understand and I'm interested in like just the human condition and like mine is so specific that like I want to know what other people have and whether people are in, like experiencing and like what they're learning and growing through. Mm -hmm. But like I wish that all politicians that were in charge of making rules for the rest of the country would go through a similar journey of being like, I'm curious, tell me more. Not like I'm scared and I don't understand and that's going to be a problem for me. Well, they don't have to, right? Because they keep getting voted in no matter what. But right. That's They've been in office yeah. since Kennedy was around, and it's not a problem. <laughs> Legitimately, yeah. But there's also been, like, especially since the 90s, like, there's been this huge societal shift to being anti-gay, to being pro-gay, and now we're seeing that with the trans rights movement as well. And that's good. I mean, it's not a quick process. Mm -hmm. It's not a painless process. But it's an important one, and it's happening again right now, and I think we're going to see better stuff for them in the future. I definitely agree. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I've got for you. <laughs> Just think, five years ago, would you have heard anyone tell you their preferred pronouns? Would you have even known what that meant five years ago? I'm thinking back to, like, in college, that's when I started hearing it. Mm -hmm. Is that, like, as a social work psychology major, well, yeah. it was around a lot more in the <laughs> classes I went to versus, like, your poli-sci classes, I'm sure? Um, even though we were at the very same college. And so I was exposed to it, but I was like, not sure what to make of it at first. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's what really led into like more curiosity and self like education to understand like, why is this so important that I should change my habits and make sure that I'm thinking of other people when like, when I'm using a pronoun, I'm not like being purposeful most of the time. It's yeah. just like an assumption. So I think that that's a really big one where it's like, yeah, you're changing your habits, but like that's the smallest thing you can give. <laughs> it is quite literally the least you can do, right? Yeah. <laughs> if someone asks you to address them a certain way, you do it. Like it's not a big deal. Yeah, and I was having a conversation with someone the other day and they said like it's the same thing like when your friend gets married and she changes her last name. Mm -hmm. If she chooses to change her last name, like you just have to make an effort to remember what that change is. It's not something that we've never done before. Right. You 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 want to call your teacher by their first name, but they ask you to call them Mr. So-and-so. Yeah. Not any different. It's not a big deal. It really shouldn't right. be an issue. But for those of us who were not in, dare I say, extra liberal curriculums in college, we did not know about this even five years ago. <laughs> and so, like, there's been tremendous progress very recently, and that's good. We need that. Yeah, I agree. So how is it being a pro-LGBTQ rights Republican? It's strange. It shouldn't be that bad, right? Because like I said before, it's much more of a generational issue. And all the Republicans I know who are my age agree with me. But that's not all the Republicans that exist. There's You can't argue that there aren't a lot of Republican boomers who still vote anti-gay, anti-trans. So... It's tough, like, having those people in my party. Like, 
I may agree with them on economic issues, but I certainly don't agree with them on this stuff. And this is like human rights stuff. So it's, um, it's challenging. You know, I've had many a, an argument with, with people in my own party. But again, it doesn't represent us. Like there is um, an organization called the Log Cabin Republicans who have been around a long time. And they are regular Republicans, except they're also pro-LGBTQ. And so that is, they're not that different, right? Like, mm-hmm. And I think as time goes on, that's going to become the majority of the party, if not the entire thing. Like that should just be the baseline for what everyone in society agrees with. I would love that. Yeah. It would be nice. And then I, you know, don't have to be embarrassed about that <laughs> issue that I happen to be in the same party with, you know? Yeah. I'm sure that it came up when you were in the state house. It did. There was a bill that came up. I'd actually forgotten about this until you just mentioned it, but there was a bill that came up. It was about adding the word um, gender into, like, who is protected in the state constitution for, like, basic rights. I remember you telling me about this at the time. Yeah, and the Republicans were majority against it. And I supported it, and I voted for it, and luckily there were enough, the Republicans were the majority at the time, and so, you know, if all of us banded together, it would have got shot down, but um, there were enough other Republicans who agreed with me, and the Democrats obviously agreed with it, and so it ended up passing, and so now um, the word gender has been added, um, which is a very good thing. No, it, it was against discrimination, right? You can't be discriminated for... Was this like a landlord, XYZ like thing? Thing? No, this was in the state constitution. Okay. There's wording in there, and like it was listing reasons you can't be discriminated against. And now one of the things is gender. And like the argument at the time was, is sex and gender really different? Of course, it is, and mm-hmm. so that has been added in. And I think that was very good. Awesome. So now, Victoria, let's pass it over to you, and let's talk about gun rights. Exciting stuff. So exciting. It is. Yeah. um, So to be clear, I hate gun violence, and I'm appalled by the number of shootings that continue to occur in America. And I know that it's common for people who identify as a liberal to be anti-gun. I'm not one of them, though. Preventing violence is just more complex than banning all guns. If no one's allowed a firearm, then only criminals will have them. And I think that if someone's really motivated to cause destruction, they'll do it by another means. So banning guns is not like a one-size-fits-all thing. I don't think that's going to solve our issues. Okay. So when you say you support gun rights, what does that mean exactly? Do you mean for hunting, for self-defense, for everything? What does it mean to you? I think that it's fine for hunting and for self-defense. I don't mind, like, people owning personal guns. Mm -hmm. It's just that there need to be background checks, which there are. I also think that there should be background checks on, like, buying bullets and, like, certain levels of firearms should be much more protected and, like, harder to get your hands on and stuff like that, which, like, a lot of this is already in place, and I think that's good. Um, I don't think that it should be, like an unmonitored system and i wish that there was more we could do to monitor like people that haven't been necessarily like charged but like the police are keeping an eye on them there's like a red flag but they can't do anything to stop the purchase like i think those are like the small little gray areas where like we hear that after a shooting where it's like oh yeah like the police have been to this person's home before but there was nothing we could do anyway. So, like, I do wish there was more, like, we could do preventatively around gun violence. But that doesn't mean that you won't find me at the gun range the day before Thanksgiving with my dad. Like, sure. that happens maybe once a year. I don't find a problem with it. <laughs> so I guess this leads me to my next question. What do you think can be done about all the mass shootings? Do you think, I guess, better background checks, uh, written restrictions on you know maybe even semi-automatic weapons like what do you think can be done if anything it's it's a really difficult issue because i think that's why so many people are anti-gun is that they're like you know what if we can't handle it if we can't have these things then no one gets to have them at all like and i understand that position it's more that 
the way the law works, there's so much gray and the law has to be black and white. And I wish that there was more gray when it pertains to protecting innocent public people from someone that's like about to boil over and like everyone's seeing the warning signs, but they haven't said something threatening. They haven't done all the things that lead up to legally being able to catch them. So I don't have an answer for you. I don't have like, okay, here's my proposed plan. Mm -hmm. I just wish there was more action that we could take leading up to an event. It feels like in so many situations, and I experience this as a case manager, it's like your hands are tied until such a point that it could be too late. And that just, I hate that. Well, that's the, the hard part, right? Like if they haven't broken a law... We can't do anything. And then if they're not on a list, if they haven't, if they've been able to right. stay off of all these things that would be triggered in a background check, then what There's else can we do? Nothing can be done except, well, I won't put words in your mouth, but like better mental health check screening, I, all of these things. I would really like to see, and I think we're making this step as a nation, like just more open communication around mental health. Mm-hmm. Right. Like it used to be you're crazy if you're seeing a therapist. And now we have all kinds of notable people admitting and freely sharing how much therapy has helped them. So less stigma around mental health, I think, is going to be really helpful because when someone is really stigmatizing mental health, like in terms of their own comfortable like level of accessing it, they're not going to get the the help that they need. And that's been the issue with all of these violent shooters, right, is that most of the time there's, like, a diagnosis that need that's untreated. Someone is off their meds. Someone has been terribly bullied, and they're not getting the help that they could have gotten. So I think, like, educating schools and workplaces with, like, the warning signs and, like, the help that people need. And I love that through COVID therapy is like available on the phone and through Zoom and that makes it more accessible. It's less shameful of like, what if someone sees me walking into that office and they know what I'm doing? Like you're just picking up a phone, like, you know, during your lunch break or whatever. So I think like we're moving in that direction, but I think people being more comfortable taking care of themselves, asking for help, accepting help, that's really what we need. That's huge, definitely. All right, let's talk about the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it off to all the folks who aren't familiar with it, but I want to know what it means to you, right? So the Second Amendment is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What do you think that means? Because I hear a lot from the left that it doesn't mean individuals can keep and bear arms. Isn't that what it just said? Well, <laughs> I guess that's the question because they, you know, I, I hear it a lot that the first part of a well-regulated militia means it's about the army, not about individuals. I think that in countries where the only people that have weapons are the the military, that can be a slippery slope too, right? Yeah. Like in order for there to be checks and balances, I think that people need to all have access to defending themselves and i don't want to be part of a country that is pushed around by its leaders and forced to just stay stay in the lines and Mm -hmm. and behave or else like taking any form of defense away from someone is you know threatening their freedom i don't like that yeah i mean that's why the second amendment exists right like it's because they overthrew a tyrannical government which, by the way, all the regular people were the militia. And so it was important that they had weapons to overthrow their tyrannical government. Right. And that's why we can protest. And that's why we can, you know, do all kinds of things that other countries haven't protected the freedoms of their citizens. So I think that's just part of it. Definitely. I'm glad to hear you say that. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) What do you think about the American concept of a good guy with a gun being the answer to a bad guy with a gun? I think there are there's a level of severity where that might be what the answer looks like. Mm-hmm. But I I believe in trying to talk someone down, use de-escalation methods and like I think that is the procedure, right, in like our law enforcement to not just 
go at someone who looks like a threat, but to talk to them and see if they're open to changing their behavior first. So I don't know that I would say, go in guns blazing. Um, I like to talk about my feelings. I think that everyone needs to talk about their feelings. <laughs> yeah, yes. But like the logic of like, I, you always hear that statement, like there is a shooting occurring and someone else who had a weapon on them was able to stop it because they had a weapon. Um, in some instances, that's probably what's happened, and I don't find a problem with that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's, <laughs> that's fair enough, fair enough. Um, what do you feel about high-capacity magazines? Would you put limits on those? That makes me uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you, you're still a Democrat deep down, but... <laughs> <laughs> Or quite obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't change you fully, but... All right. So you would limit the amount that the magazines could have. I would, and I would also, like, keep an eye, like, a record of, like, who's buying a ton of bullets and for what reason, you know? Mm -hmm. Which I... I think... Believe they do. I think we yeah. do, or at least in some states. So, tell me this. What is it like being a pro-gun Democrat? It can be uncomfortable. I remember being in college and going to school for social work and psychology is obviously very like a liberal education. Um, it's surrounded by like teachers and students that all think that they're of like the same mind. And so a lot of people would assume that I was on the same page with them about every single issue. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would purposefully, like, not give certain information, like, you know, how was your Thanksgiving break? It was good, not like I went out with my dad and my brothers to, like, arrange, you know? Again, right. like, maybe this has happened a handful of times, but, like, still not information that I want, like, all my classmates that are, you know, it's just uncomfortable to have that conversation. I feel like it's a private issue, so I'm not super vocal about it and that's the same thing with like people assumed that i wasn't religious like you know talking about like all these uh, christians being the problem and i'm sitting there in class and i'm like um <laughs> i think we're all on the same team <laughs> like i don't understand um just the generalization isn't good in either way and i think that's why we wanted to bring up this new format so we can address that a little bit yeah i mean we've agreed on everything just about in this episode, so it was a lot of uh, patting each other on the back. <laughs> I know, not much debating happening here. No debating, but it's important. Like, we don't have to agree 100% with our team, right? Like, I'm not red team every time, and you're not blue team every time. Like, we're human beings, and we have different opinions. Yeah, and that's... I think promotes like talking across the aisle, right? Like I don't want to like sh put on my blinders and just be like, this is what my party says. So this is what I'm doing. And that's all you can do. Yeah, exactly. Thank you everyone for listening to this episode of The Great Compromise. If you liked it, tell your friends about it. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and check out our YouTube channel. And we will see you next week.